Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, I got something that I want to show you and I want to prove to you that I was right. I was right. I was right. I, I, I was right. I knew I was right. Ooh, I was right. I told y'all. I know. Oh, I'm sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, if I said that for every time I was right, I would never stop talking. You already never stop talking. Exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, I told you guys that there is no such thing as a property tax. Unless you have an extra property, the city, the county, the state government cannot charge you property taxes on your primary residence. Impossible. This is from Washington. Now, this is what Washington's going to say. Why, 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 wait, wait, hold on. Let me show y'all what Washington going to say. Uh-oh, I messed up. I messed them up. Uh-oh. It says, slip opinion. Hey, this is not the final decision. Okay, that's the first thing they tell you. There's not a final decision. This is the Supreme Court of the state of Washington. Them cracking, I mean, them uh, more, I mean, them, I mean, the stupid, I mean, the Supreme Court of the state of Washington, okay? Now, let me show you something. These are a bunch of um, in black, indigenous, people of color folks. That's who these are. Now, hold on. My opinion, they brought the wrong argument. But they brought the argument anyway, and it was a good argument. A good argument, people. So go look this case up. I'm, I'm going to put the link. Y'all know how I is. I'm going to put the link in the description. Those of you who are interested in understanding the principle of law, you don't want to use this case. You want to use the case law and the argument that the court is making. Let's do this. We're going to control F. Control F. You see, we got rights right there. I got a right to Band-Aid because Band-Aid's to call me. Now, let's go to the first one. Come on now. Let's go to the first one. No, that's 35 and 36. I said one. All right, now let's, now I want y'all to pay attention. The capital gains tax, capital gains. Now, remember, there's a difference between capital gains taxes and property taxes. Shh, pay attention. The capital gains tax is appropriately characterized as an excise tax because excise means tax because it is levied. Oh my God, they levied me. On the sale or exchange of capital gains. So when you're buying a home, they can tax you because you're making a profit. Okay, somebody's gaining something. Either somebody's gaining a property or they gaining money, but somebody gonna be taxed. Congress has the right to do that. They have the right to impose excise taxes. Whew, so glad we got that out of the way. Lord have mercy. All right, pay attention. Not on the capital assets, the property or gains, the money itself. So, see, they can't put a tax on the property or the money. They can put a tax on the income. That's a very important word, income. Most people don't know what the word income means. Income means everything in and above your cost of living, your absolute necessities. It's the bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. Y'all know what I'm saying. Hey, Jungle, get on over here with that book. You feel me? Hold on. This understanding of the tax is consistent. This understanding, the one that we just had, the one that I just talked about, that I've been talking about for years, for years. Hold on. It says it is consistent with the long line of precedents. Yep, they voted for this precedent, okay? He's the king. He's precedent for life recognizing excise taxes i told you excise always means taxes doesn't mean extra sizing it means they sitting up there attacking you putting some weight on your shoulder that's what it means it means they're putting some weight a burden on your shoulder as those levied see i told you they're levying you on the exercise of a right associated with property ownership. You see, you have the right to own property. Now notice what it says. 
This understanding of the tax is consistent with the long line of precedent recognized in excise taxes as those levied on the exercise of a right associated with property, such as the power to sell or exchange property, in contrast with property taxes levied on a property itself. There's a difference. Selling a property, yeah, they can tax you for that. But owning a property, no, they can't tax you for that. That's what they're saying. Hold on now. Because a capital gains tax is an excise tax under Washington law and every state law. It is not subject to uniformity or levy requirements of Article 7 of the Washington State Constitution. We further hold that capital gains taxes is consistent with our state's constitution's privileges and immunities clause. That's right, it's a privilege to sell your property. And they're right. You don't have the right to sell your property, you have the right to own property. Pay attention. Now technically you do have the right to sell property because you have the right to do with your property as you choose. It's yours. But they say if you make it a capital gains, they got the right to tax you. Now, if it's an even exchange, they can't tax you on it because there's no capital gains. But people don't understand taxes. They don't understand the value of the property and you're selling the property for the value. You can only be taxed on the income, the gain. But y'all don't get it and I'm not here to tell it to y'all. I'm only here to point out the facts. We therefore reject the plaintiff's factual challenge of the capital gains tax and remain it to the trial court for further proceedings with this opinion. So this is a final opinion because they've already remanded the case back to the, the state trial. Now, hold on, this was just, y'all Y'all need to understand what's going on here. Wait, 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 where that date at? See that date right there? This 2023, they've already, this was the entire court. This wasn't just a couple of little panel, this was the en banc court. This the entire court, that's what that means. That means they were en banc. They weren't a bank, yes they were, they weren't a bank, it, it says the bank. What, you didn't you never seen Bank Bank of America? Go ahead and type it in. B-A-N-C of America. They're a bank. Shh. They'll tell you this means the entire court. No, it doesn't. Watch this. The Supreme Court of the State of Washington. They know who they is. Okay, now let's go on now. We we got it, we got we got some things to talk about. We ain't gonna go too far. We're only gonna go to page three. I mean, the, the third time it appears. It ain't letting me get there. I'll see you when you get there. See you when you get there. Okay. However, the Superior Court erred in its application of our precedents, which firmly indicates that tax is an excise. Go ahead and learn what an excise is, ladies and gentlemen. Tax is always an excise. Okay. A steady line of cases beginning with Culleton defining a property tax as a tax on the mere ownership of property, while an excise tax applies to the exercise of rights in and to the property or exercised of a privilege. Ownership of a property is a right. It is not a privilege. But the Charging one an excise tax is that on the privilege of selling their property. The capital gains tax is an excise tax because the borrower did not owe, get on out of here, a capital gains tax merely by virtue of owning the capital assets, the property, or capital gains like a property tax. Instead, the tax relates to the excise of the rights in and to the property, namely the power to sell and transfer the capital access, I mean assets, like an excise. They were exercising an immunity and a privilege. See, that's your immunity and privileges. You have the privilege to sell your property, and because it's a privilege, they're not converting a right to a privilege. But owning a property? No, that's a different thing. Now, you notice how they word it uniquely? So let's do it again so you guys see what's being said, because I know many of y'all didn't get it. However, the Superior Court erred in its application of our precedents, 
Why? Because they never said that you could be charged a tax on your property, your primary residence. That's called the right to live. They cannot tax you on the right to live. It's illegal. We firmly indicate, uh, which firmly indicates, we firmly indicated in the past, this tax is an excise. What tax is an excise? The tax on a property sale, the capital gains. A steady line of cases, beginning with Colleton, defines a property tax, now pay attention, as a tax on the mere ownership of property. Now, they're not talking about the ownership of property. They're letting you know that there's a distinction. And there's a steady line of cases distinguishing the ownership of property from the selling of property. So pay attention to the distinction. While an excise tax, now they just told you, here's the conversion. We're going from one to the other. Property tax and excise tax, two different things. Property tax deals with the ownership of property. Excise deals with the right to sell the property, applies to the exercise of a right in and to the property, or to exercise a privilege, i.e. excise. The capital gains tax, on it's an excise tax. Oh, look at that, it says it, it's an excise tax. Because the taxpayers do not own the capital gains tax merely by virtue of owning the capital assets, the property. So they're saying the property, the capital gains, they don't own that. They don't have a right to the capital gains. They don't have a right to the profit. They only have a right to their necessities, the simple bare necessities. Okay? That's what they're saying. Like a property tax. See, you can't be taxed on your property because this is a right. That's what they're saying. Uh-oh, I'm sorry, Washington. Hold on. We got to get you back there. Uh-uh, I'm, 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 I'm ladies and gentlemen. It's this mouse. The way I have the computer set up, I'm right-handed. And this mouse, the way it's situated, it's situated off to the left. So I'm sorry, y'all. I didn't mean to. I, I swears I didn't, boss. I swears. Let's get back to that page number three, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> Whatever. Whew. Well, look, I, I missed it, but let's go back again. Much of our modern taxation landscape can be traced to the 1930s, an era of rapid socioeconomic change and accompanying tax reform efforts and related state Supreme Court decisions challenging those efforts. The court's decisions from that era still shape Washington law today. Capital gains tax must be understood in the context of history. So we provide historical overviews of taxation in Washington since early statehood before turning to the underlying facts of procedural histories of this case. Ooh wait, they gonna go to the early precedent. See, uh-oh, hold on now. In 1891, 95% of the states and local tax revenues came from property taxes. They're not telling the truth, ladies and gentlemen. They didn't charge people on their property. Okay, watch this. I, I haven't read this before. A valorium tax is imposed proportionately on the value of something, real property, rather than on the quantity or something or some other measure. Property tax at 1760, a tax levied on the owner of the property, especially real property, usually based on the property's value. That's Black's Law Dictionary, ladies and gentlemen. They ain't got no right to tax you on your property because the Constitution doesn't give them that right. During the early periods, raw their economy was driven by farming, lodging, and mining, fishing, and other industries. Pay attention. Reflection of the state's abundant land and natural resources. Ladies and gentlemen, the state doesn't own the land, so they can't tax you on it. It's not theirs. They can tax you only on the capital gains. That's what this case is all about. In 1889, a major portion of the wealth of the state laid in its lands and their produce. Property taxes proved a fairly equitable and effective way to fund government because in those days, the value of tangible property was great and the cost of government little. Things changed, however, with the population expanding in the state. Urbanized. Washington's population more than tripled between 1890 and 1910. 
This fueled a greater need for government services and government programs, especially education and roads. Ladies and gentlemen, the government does have the right to levy taxes, but they cannot levy taxes against your primary residence. It's called a property tax. They don't have authority to levy tax on your property. However, if you own three properties, four properties, five properties, two properties, they can levy on the extra because that's beyond the income. So I want y'all to see something. Give me a second. Get, get, move on down. Move on down the road. Oh. I don't know if I did that. Give me one second. No, not that one. I got to do control V. That's what I want. I got to insert the link, y'all. No, it won't let me. I got to go here. That's where I got to insert the link. Come on now. It's on down. It's on down the road. Oh. oh, this is the new site, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Data Masters. Geocentric Corporation. Data Masters. Welcome to the Data Masters. The Data Masters. These are the individuals who are going to help process the taxation paperwork. Why are they going to do that? Because the law, the law, the law says that Congress only has the authority to levy a tax on income. And income is defined as anything of, in and above the necessities of life. Now, most of y'all won't know that. You'll go to any tax agent. Oh, no, you can't do that. No, Congress has the right to do whatever they want. Congress does not have the right to do whatever they want. If Congress had the right to do whatever they want, there wouldn't be so many Supreme Court challenges. It's just that people bring the wrong argument. You see, first of all, let's do your income. If Congress had the right, and we're going to go to Google, but if Congress had the right to tax you on your income, that would make you a slave. That would mean that you didn't have the right to work. You didn't have the right to pursue an occupation of your choice. That means that government controls your labor. Now, wait, hold on a minute. If government controls your labor, then it's no longer a right. They've converted a right to a privilege. This is Murdoch. No state may impose a charge on the enjoyment of a right granted by the federal constitution. Well, you have the right to live. The right to earn a living is part of the right to live. No state may impose a tax on that right. Now, hold on. That's just one case. Here, the right to travel. No state shall convert a right to a privilege. And the petitioner has, there can be no sanctions or penalty imposed on one simply because they exercise a right. Then Congress does not have the power. See, Congress has the power to impose a corporation tax. Now, we just read the Washington case and everything they said was business. Farming, fishing, okay? That was all business. That wasn't personal. Now, here's that Murdoch versus the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. This is a license tax, a flat tax imposed on the exercise of a privilege granted by the Bill of Rights. The state may not impose a charge for the enjoyment of a right. So when I say they cannot charge you for exercising a right, you had better believe they can. There are too many cases that say that they can. Do not flow from the exercise of any right or rule of conduct created or imposed by the state. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Supreme Court of the United States. They've consistently said that, and all the other courts have no other choice but to fall behind. The understanding of the tax is consistent with the long line of precedence recognizing excise taxes are those levied on the exercise of a right. Well, guess what? They cannot levy a tax on your rights. That would mean there are no Bill of Rights. Remember, Congress shall make no law abridging the rights of the people? <laughs> Some of y'all need to understand what's going on here. There can be no imposition and no tax held on you primarily because you've exercised a right. No state may convert a right to a privilege. Okay? Just that simple. Just that simple. All right, let's get back on up here to my question. Hold on now. 16th Amendment of the Constitution was ratified in 1913, not by the people. It allows Congress to levy taxes on income from any source without appropriations, it among the states, or without regards to census. Wait, hold on. Congress does not have the right. Congress does not have the right to impose a tax on people within the state because they have no authority within the state. Pay attention. Go back and look at the 9th and 10th Amendment. Shh. But nobody's ever challenged them on that. 
they always bring up the wrong arguments. The Ninth and Tenth Amendment rights retained and reserved by the people. It's a violation of the First Amendment. Now that that's okay. They they talk about income tax. Ladies and gentlemen, I want y'all to pay attention. Prior to 1913, <laughs> there was no so-called income tax. Prior to 1850, you won't even find a, a single Supreme Court case talking about a tax on people's income. It was never envisioned in the Constitution. That's just something they came up with. They had to pay for the war and all that stuff. Yeah, I know. Interesting, ain't it? Now, Google is going to do like everybody else. So it ain't going to give me the answer to the question because it can't. Okay? Nobody doesn't, nobody is saying Congress does not have the power to tax people. What we're saying that Congress does not have the power to tax you on a right. Pay attention. Not a wrong, a right. There's a right and a wrong way to love somebody. Okay, they don't have the right to tax you on your rights. No state may convert a right to a privilege. That includes Congress. Go back and look at the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law abridging the right of the people. That's for the entire Bill of Rights, people. If you don't believe the entire Bill of Rights applies to all the First Ten Amendments, and the First Amendment applies to the entire Bill of Rights, that it's a continual writing that they did not separate the amendments. Congress, when they put it together, separated the amendments. Because they're key points, but they're the same document. So it's read as one, not as separate amendments. One amendment leads to the next. You don't believe me? Go back and read it as if it was a paragraph, and don't read it as if it is separate one after the other. One amendment leads to the other. That's why the Fourth Amendment leads to the Fifth Amendment. Second Amendment gives you the right to protect yourself. Let's say you didn't do that right. Just like in the scriptures, if you cause injury or harm or death to somebody, then they get to complain. So in the Bible, they got to go to the leaders of the people. Those leaders were usually the priests or the judges. Okay? When they went to them, that decision, for the most part, wasn't final because they could appeal. So that's your Second and Fourth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment, hey, if somebody is going to charge you with something, they need to have evidence. They can't just charge you and then force you to testify against Uh-uh. That's what they do now. They couldn't do that. The Constitution prohibited that. So once you all understand this stuff, whoo-wee! Now, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let let let's um, let's make sure y'all understand. Watch this. Hold on. Let, well, let's do that. Income is defined as anything in and above the necessities of life. That's the comment. Whew. Discretionary income. Nobody asked about. I didn't say nothing about no discretionary income. See, what can be defined as income? What is considered income? Excuse me, let's do this one. What's considered income? Generally, you must include gross income, everything you receive in payment for personal service. Ladies and gentlemen, if it's personal service, how can you charge me? Now, they say generally. Why do they say generally? Generally is not specific. In addition to wages, salaries, commissions, fees, tips, this includes other forms of compensation such as fringe benefits and stock options. Ladies and gentlemen, compensation. We're going to do that word. we got to do that word because that word's important. Impotent. So we're going to copy that word. That's necessary. But hold on now. What are the necessities of life? Necessities of life refer to food, clothing, shelter, sleep heat and other basic needs to stay alive so how can they charge you to live hmm how can they you notice how they keep saying generally <sighs> and people fall for that generally stuff ladies and gentlemen this is income after your necessities of life then that's a privilege Anything above and beyond the necessities of life, and they've determined the necessities of life is anything above the national average for the cost of living. That's why it's called the cost of living. Why do you think they have a natural national average for the cost of living? <sighs> shame, shame, shame. 
That's why paying taxes is voluntary. Because y'all simply don't know. See, ain't nobody asking about nobody's poverty. We're asking simply about income. And now they're talking about poverty. Why couldn't they just stick with the question? Income. Now, we're going to keep hearing that word generally. <sighs> now, let's go to this, because this is actually, this is Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, I call it Wikipedia, because for the most part, anybody can inject their opinion. Income is the consumption and, get on out of here, and savings opportunity gain by an entity within a specific time frame. Is the consumption and saving opportunity gain. It has to be a gain. Well, ladies and gentlemen, after your necessities, how can it be a gain? Your necessities cannot be taxed. Okay? Now, watch this. They're going to give the definition from the IRC. <sighs> For households and individuals in the United States, income is defined by tax law as a sum that includes any wages, salary, profit, interest payments, rent, or other form of earnings received in a calendar year. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not receiving wages. No, 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 no. The wages comes after labor. So once you compensate me for my labor, then that junk that's in excess of that is wages. But my labor, <laughs> that's an exchange. That's called an even exchange. And Congress does not have the right to levy a tax on my efforts, my right to pursue happiness. And that's what people don't understand. Think about it. How could Congress tax me on my work? That's like Congress charging me to do these videos right now. Oh, yeah, you can only do these videos if you pay $150. A year. No, a video. That don't make no sense, does it? So how could I have an agreement with my employer and the government come in and say, well, no, we're we going to charge y'all for having this agreement. We're going to charge you the employer and we're going to charge you the employee. Excuse me? Who told y'all y'all get to take control of this contract? This is our contract. You cannot impede the obligation of this contract. Get them out of here, mother. Okay. That's... The Constitution was written by the people. The people never allow Congress to tax their wages. No, yeah, 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 yeah. Congress is supposed to tax. They have to. They got to fund government. But funding government works this way. Cigarettes, excise. Alcohol, excise. Those are industries created. That's why having a steel mill, they frowned against that. But if you had a steel mill for your own production, for your own personal use, they couldn't do anything about that. I know, I know they did, but the law said they couldn't. Whew. All right, now watch this. For a firm, gross income can be defined as all sums of revenue minus the cost of goods sold. Wait, wait, wait. Minus the, oh, minus the necessities, those expenses, the depreciation, the interest, and the taxes. So, see, they get to only pay for everything in addition to their necessities. Equal protection of law says the same thing holds for you. But y'all don't know that. Shh, don't tell nobody about no equal protection of law that they know that y'all don't have to pay on all of your wages. It says any wages. So you got to understand what a wage is. You got to understand what a salary is. You got to understand what a profit is. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, if only you guys knew what's really going on. They're using words to enslave people. Whew. So if you really want to understand what's going on, take this sentence and break it down. Now let's do this. <clears throat> Let me clear my throat. We can go to perplexity. Let me see, what question did I ask perplexity? How do I determine the firms I set for tax filings? I, I'm I'm doing something, y'all. Uh, set up a trust. That uh, no, I don't want all of that. That that's too much. No, that that's that's too much for y'all right now. <laughs> Hold on. Wake up. 
So this means that for a corporation, comma, before they account for their taxes, comma, they can offset the NOLs, comma, the net operating losses, question mark. Stop listening. Net income for a firm is the total amount of profits made over a given period after deduction of all expenses. It's the same thing for you, but y'all don't understand equal protection of law. Y'all keep looking at that word generally and not understanding what it's saying. There's always an exception, people. See, businesses, that's why you want to do everything as a business. That's why you want to do everything as a sole proprietor, because you get to write off all your expenses, all of your expenses, all of your expenses. This includes the cost of goods sold, operating expenses, depreciation, interest, and taxes. It is a key indicator of a company's overall profitability and calculated as revenues minus expenses, interest, and taxes. Before accounting for taxes, a corporation can offset net operating losses against its gross income, which can help reduce tax liability in future years. That means a credit. This means that net operating losses can be reduced, uh, can be used to reduce taxable income in future years. That is that carry forward credit, providing a potential tax benefit for corporations. Wake up. So under equal protection of law, Stop listening. Net income is indeed a crucial financial metric that reflects the profitability of a company after all operating and non-operating costs, expenses, and taxes have been subtracted from total revenues. This figure is pivotal for investors, management, and other stakeholders to assess the financial health and operational efficiency of a company. So you Additionally, NOLs serve as a strategic tax tool. They occur when a company's allowable tax deductible expenses exceed its taxable revenues, resulting in a negative taxable income for the year. The tax code in many jurisdictions allows companies to apply these losses to offset taxable income in other years, which can significantly reduce their tax liabilities. This can be particularly beneficial for smoothing out tax payments over time, especially for companies with fluctuating income. The specific rules for how NOLs can be carried back to previous tax years or carried forward to future tax years, including any limitations or expiration of such NOLs, vary by jurisdiction and are subject to changes in tax laws. Okay, so businesses get to, after their expenses, <clears throat> cost of doing business, after their expenses, businesses get to assess their taxes, so why can't y'all do the same thing? Hold on now. Wake up. The Supreme Court has held that a business has constitutional rights, comma, because it is defined under the Constitution as a person, comma, is this not correct? Question mark. Stop listening. The notion that businesses have certain constitutional rights because they are recognized as persons under U.S. Law primarily stems from the interpretation of the Constitution and various Supreme Court rulings, rather than an explicit definition within the Constitution itself. The U.S. Constitution does not directly address corporations or explicitly define them as persons. However, over time, the U.S. Supreme Court has interpreted the Constitution to afford certain protections to corporations, largely based on the 14th Amendment which was originally intended to protect the rights of freed slaves. Hobby Lobby. One of the landmarks Hobby cases Lobby. often cited in discussions about corporate personhood is Citizens United v. Federal Election Commission, 558 U.S. 310, 2010. In this case, the Supreme Court held that the government cannot limit corporate spending on political communication during... Okay, so watch this. Think, wake up. 
Thank you. That was very educational. Comma. So if the Supreme Court has held that corporations have certain constitutional rights, including equal protection of law, comma, this would apply to corporations as well as citizens? Question mark. Stop listening. Yes, the principle that corporations have certain constitutional rights, including the equal protection of the law, does apply to corporations in addition to individual citizens, though the application... Okay, shut up. Shut up. Don't care about no application. However, the extent to which the equal protection... Be, be, be quiet. I ain't talking about extent. Wake up. So, corporations get to write off their expenses before calculating their revenue taxes, comma, this means that individuals get to do the exact same thing, comma, write off their living expenses before calculating their taxes. Is this not correct? Question mark. I mean, if a corporation has the right to write off their expenses, comma, their cost of doing business, comma, then an individual, comma, has the right to write off their expenses for the cost of living, comma, since Congress guaranteed individuals having the, open quote, right to the necessities of life, close quote, under the March 12, 1933 Act, exclamation mark, stop listening. It's called the necessities of life, ladies and gentlemen. Go back and read it. You can't be charged taxes for the necessities of life. Hold on now. The comparison between corporations deducting business expenses and individuals deducting personal living expenses before calculating taxes involves understanding the distinct tax principles that apply to businesses and individuals. Really? There are principles? Tax law. While corporations can deduct a wide range of business expenses and calculate their taxable income, the rules for individuals are different oh, there are rules. in scope. Rules. Corporate deductions corporations are allowed to deduct Hold on, watch this. Rates. Excuse me. For individuals, the tax code provides certain allowances and deductions aimed at encouraging specific economic... Hold on, ladies and gentlemen. We don't care about encouraging economics. Wake up. I didn't ask you about any rules. Comma, we're talking about the principle of equal protection, period. I didn't ask you about encouraging economic development or economic growth. Comma, we're talking about the principles of writing off necessities for the cost of exercising a right, comma, for individuals, comma, the right to live, comma, for corporations, the right to engage in business. Question mark. So focus on that and stop trying to convince me that rules apply, comma, because this is the law we're talking about and its application, comma, not some rule, because there is no rule book for denying people the right, comma, to write off their right to life expenses. Exclamation mark. Stop listening. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes I got to set it straight, let it know where it should be going. <laughs> the principle of equal protection under the law, as provided by the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, ensures that no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction I didn't ask the equal about protection that. of the laws. This foundational principle is crucial in protecting individuals and entities against discriminatory practices. However, its application to tax law, particularly in the context of deductions for individuals versus corporations, involves interpretations that are not always directly parallel. See, no, hold on, ladies and gentlemen. And policy -driven question regarding the hold on. You notice what he says is not always directly parallel? That's what equal protection means. It has to be directly parallel. If a corporation gets right off its expenses as a cost of doing business and they're considered persons, then I got to get to run off my expenses. That's why I'm a sole proprietor. It's the cost of living. Okay? 
Now, your inquiry raised a philosophical, I wasn't a policy-driven question. I'm not dealing with no stupid policy. Do you guys understand there's no law? Okay, the concept of allowing deduction for cost of living for individuals as a right. Oh, God. Analogous with, to corporations deducting their operating expenses touches on a broader discussion about tax equality and social policy. I, I, I'm not touching on no policies. Again, I told you to stay away from policies, you ignorant moron. For individuals, the tax code provides certain deductions and credits aimed at recognizing specific burdens or encouraging certain behaviors. I don't care about encouragement. I get to write off my expenses. They're called the necessities of life. This distinction does not necessarily... See, there's that other word. Whenever they lose generally, necessarily, typically, potentially... Pay attention. Those words are catch-all phrases. In other words, there's always an exception they're not trying not to talk about. Okay? So what? wake up. Wake up. It's the first of the month. Okay. Wake up. Wake up. So what you're saying is that there is no prohibition in the tax code for individuals writing off their living expenses as part of the necessities of life? Question mark. It's just a policy. Comma, can you explain how a policy can override the intent of Congress? Question mark. And if a policy cannot override the intent of Congress, comma, then the March 12, 1933 Act, comma, where Congress says it was imperative for the states to provide for the necessities of life for individuals during this national emergency, comma, would mean that they get to write off those expenses incurred respecting the necessities of life. Question mark. You are the best. I am so glad you helped me realize these facts. Comma. And here I was thinking that you were trying to imply that a policy could somehow supersede the law or a constitutional right, thereby converting a right to a privilege. Comma. And I knew you would never do something like that. Comma. I apologize for thinking that you would say something that was incorrect and give me a non-specific answer as if it was the correct answer. Comma, I will try not to do it again. Period. Stop listening. Sorry. Sometimes you just gotta. Oh, it's a complex... <laughs> Man, I'm complex! Your question touches on complex issues of tax law, legislative intent, and public policy, as well as the balance between statutory law and constitutional principles. He's gonna give me an explanation! explanation to address your points. Tax code provisions vs. Congressional intent the tax code is a product of congressional legislation. It's a product of? of Congress at the time of enactment. Really? It specifies which expenses individuals and corporations can do. Does it do that? For individuals, the tax code allows deductions for certain specific expenses, example mortgage interest, medical expenses above a certain threshold, educational expenses, and business expenses for self-employed individuals. However, it does not allow for the deduction of living expenses broadly as they are considered personal expenses, not incurred for the production of income. Hold on, hold on, I gotta I got stop that. Now I want y'all to pay attention. Did you hear what he said? and business expenses for self-employed individuals. Remember, they don't define what business is. Shh, don't tell nobody. <laughs> anyway, now they say policy and congressional intent. Now, he goes, with reference to the March 12, 1933 Act, appears to invoke the emergency measures during the Great Depression, particularly around banking and economic efforts. While these measures were aimed at addressing economic crisis of the time, including now, including provisions of relief and recovery, the specific application of these measures to current tax deductions of individual living expenses is not direct. The law 
and welfare policies involved since 1933 and the provisions and necessities of life generally address through direct support programs rather than tax deduction for all personal living expenses. Now watch what I do to him now, because he's stupid. Wake up. So according to you, comma, the tax code only allows these deductions and do not account for any others, comma, so when you say, open quote, e.g., comma, mortgage interest, comma, medical expenses above certain thresholds, comma, educational expenses and business expenses, close quote, comma, there are no other categories that are included, such as, comma, living expenses, i.e., the cost of living, question mark. So you are saying that the code specifically prohibits an individual deducting their cost of living, comma, could you provide the section that specifically prohibits the deduction of the cost of living, comma, I am very interested to see when Congress did that unconstitutional act, question mark. Stop listening. I am so sorry about his ignorance, everybody. I apologize. The distinction I aim to clarify involves the nature of deductions allowed for individuals under the U.S. Tax code, which is structured to permit deductions for specific... Wake up. You will answer my question directly, comma. I gave you a specific question and a specific parameter for which to respond, comma. Do not deviate from responding to my question directly, comma, succinctly, comma, without convolution, comma, nuances, comma, and or clarifications, exclamation mark. Answer my question and provide the tax code that prohibits the deduction of living expenses, since you said an individual cannot deduct the cost of living expenses, exclamation mark. Stop listening. Yeah, it, it tries to avoid answering my questions because, you know, I, I put it in a box. Tax code does not contain a specific section that explicitly prohibits the deduction of living expenses by individuals in the manner you are asking. Hold on. Instead, the tax code specifies what expenses are deductible, implying that expenses not explicitly mentioned as deductible are not allowed as deductions. For clarity, the tax code... Wait, wait, wait. He says implying. Whew. Except as otherwise expressed, expressly provided in this chapter, no deductions shall be allowed for personal living or family expenses. Ooh -wee. This section effectively means that the cost of living expenses, personal living, and family expenses are generally not deducted because they are expressly provided for as deductions elsewhere in, look, because they are not expressly provided for as deductions on a tax code. Hold on. Watch this. Wake up. Thank you. Comma, that is the answer to my question. Comma, so are you saying it is not otherwise provided in the chapter? Comma, that there are no deductions for living expenses, comma, family expenses or personal expenses within that chapter of the code? Question mark, or elsewhere? In the IRC? Question mark. Please provide the sections that allow for personal expenses, comma, living expenses, and family expenses, comma, especially since families get tax credits for certain deductions. 
comma, and individuals get certain living expenses and personal expenses, comma, how dare you try to convolute the fact that there are no deductions for personal, comma, living or family expenses, comma, that the phrase exclude does not include question mark stop listening the U.S. tax code specifically section 262 generally disallows deductions for personal living or family expenses see there he is using that word again throughout the tax code that allow for hold on there are exceptions throughout the tax code that allows for specific deductions and credits, which can be viewed as addressing certain types of personal expenses under defined conditions. <laughs> These exceptions do not broadly cover living expenses, family expenses, but are targeted towards specific policy goals. Here are examples of such deductions and credits for individuals and families. Okay, pay attention. He gives this section to let us know that this section applies to everything. This is just section 262. This section only applies this only applies to this chapter. Does not apply to any other chapter. Watch this. Wake up. Thank you for documenting that the section that you listed comma, only applies to that chapter and not to the other provisions of the code, comma, you have been wonderful, period. So, comma, there is no prohibition in the code for deducting living expenses, comma, the cost of life, comma, which is protected by the Constitution and the code does not supersede the Constitution, comma, you are wonderful, exclamation mark, Stop listening. Stop. It's crucial to correctly understand how tax law and constitutional law intersect and apply. Really? The U.S. Hold on. Tax code, including its limitations on deductions for personal, living, or family expenses <sighs> outlined in Section 262, is designed within the framework of constitutional principles. The tax code does not override the Constitution but operates within its boundaries, established by Congress through legislation. While Section 262 specifies that personal, living, or family expenses are generally not deductible, this does not infringe upon constitutional rights but reflects policy Nobody said it infringes upon constitutional rights. Nobody said that. Ladies and gentlemen, what is designed within the framework of constitutional principles? That's not even the answer to my question. Ooh, it is crucial to correctly understand how tax law and constitutional law operate. Why, why would I want to understand that? It's important to understand the structure and principles of the U.S. Tax code within the broader context of U.S. Hold on. Wake up. That's not the answer to my question, comma, I told you. I want direct answers to my question, comma. Since the exception only applies to that chapter, comma, that means it does not apply to the other chapters of the code, exclamation mark, and the code cannot interfere with the rights secured by the Constitution, including, comma, the Fifth Amendment right to life, comma, and the Ninth and Tenth Amendments reserved and retained rights by and to the people. Exclamation mark. So, unless you can provide something in the Constitution that says that Congress gets to override these principles of law, comma, as the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, comma, and they get to tax the people on their right to life, i.e., colon, cost of living, comma, then you need to shut up. Exclamation mark. 
I do not want your nuances, comma, I don't want your it's important to clarify, comma, I want a specific and direct answer to my question without soliloquy, comma, without convolution, comma, without nuances, comma, and without any stupid clarifications, exclamation mark. You do not get to tell me what the law is, comma, I am the one who is one of the people of the United States. Comma, I am the one who's associated with ordaining a constitution. Comma, how dare you think that you are smarter than I am or know more about the law than I do? Exclamation mark. You better check your attitude, mister. Stop listening. I need an apology. I need a hug. Give me my hug. The Constitution does not explicitly grant Congress the authority to tax specific types of income or expenses, including the cost of living. The power of Congress to levy taxes is broadly outlined in Article I, Section 8, Clause 1 of the U.S. Constitution, which gives Congress the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, excises. for the common defense and general welfare of the United States, but all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. The tax code, including its provisions on what is and is not deductible, he didn't answer through legislation passed by Congress. He didn't answer my question. The tax code cannot infringe upon constitutional rights. Hold on. He didn't answer my question. He hasn't talked about. <laughs> he hasn't talked about anything that I just talked about. He hasn't answered my question nowhere in the least. He hasn't talked about the fact that it says. I understand it's your concern for direct answers. The U. S. Constitution sets the foundational legal framework for the country, including the powers of Congress and the rights Hold of individuals. On. The Constitution, through Article I. Hold on. The specifics of what can and cannot be deducted in terms of personal and living expenses are determined by the tax code. No, it isn't. <laughs> it ain't determined by no stupid tax code. The tax code was not even a statute at large. The tax code is a combination of all the tax laws that they put together and they decided to codify it. The Constitution's Fifth Amendment guarantees the right to due process, protecting individuals from being deprived of life, liberty, and that means it guarantees the right to life, liberty, and property, you ignorant idiot. The Ninth Amendment states that the enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights, the right to live, shall not be construed to deny or discourage others retained by the people, and the tent reserves these powers not delegated to the state. Okay, he talks about the Constitution, but he doesn't talk about the fact that the uh, fact that it says in this chapter, ladies and gentlemen, that's what I was focusing on because he's an idiot. He said it. Y'all heard him. Except as otherwise expressly provided in this chapter, no deductions shall be allowed for a personal according to that chapter. It doesn't speak about the other chapter. Because why? Y'all heard him. He did it right here. He talks about other chapters. This is section 24, section 32. There are other chapters where taxes are allowed for family and personal. Ta-da! So again, Congress does not have the right to tax life. They never were granted that authority. They can only tax an excise. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me show that to you because many of y'all won't understand. That was the. That's how we got started. The whole thing about the Supreme Court of Washington was the excise tax, ladies and gentlemen, because Congress was assessing an excise tax. Where's that excise at? Hold on. I got to exercise. Come on now. Where are you at, excise? Come on now. It says uh, deductions and taxations, living expenses. No, where's the excise at? I just had it. I just saw it because I just read it. <sighs> it said Congress can levy these taxes on excising and imports and all of that stupid stuff. I was apologize. I know I done skipped it and I done went over it, but hey, that's what he said Congress gets to do. They have the authority under the, oh, I oh I know what I did. I reset it because I said he didn't answer my question. Okay, but excises and other things, but not private. 
they have no authority over people's private property. Although they want authority over people's private property, they ain't got none. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop this video. I just turned off uh, a device because I got my generator going because it's been raining and it's been cloudy all day and I haven't been able to take care of things the way I want to take care of them. And so now I'm taking care of them because they need to be taken the care of. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you all have learned something. I hope even the people who know the people who filed that lawsuit, I hope they learned something too. Because I've known this all my life. Okay? And I, you can go and tell uh, Casey and JoJo that I've known this all my life since they all their lives. Uh, they prayed for someone like me. You follow me? Anyway, I gotta go. So y'all have a good day. And we will talk. Arrivederci, y'all.